Ladies, gentlemen, and fellow students, welcome to yet another interview by Room for Discussion. Today, we have the honor of interviewing Nobel Peace Prize laureate of 2011, Mrs. Tawakul Karmi. Mrs. Karmi, you are often introduced as the first Arab woman and second Muslim woman to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Yet at the time, you were also the youngest Nobel Peace Prize award winner altogether. We're here today, excited with the opportunity to discuss your journey as a young Yemeni journalist and political activist, to understand your role in the political reality of Yemen, all the way from 2005, with your journalistic work, to the 2011 Arab Spring or Yemeni Revolution, and start shedding light to the intricacies and realities of a country going through a grueling civil war. Mrs. Carmen, thank you for joining us, and it's an honor to have you here. Welcome, yes, Mrs. Carmen. Um, despite uh, the differences in opinion regarding uh, the reform in Yemen, you have earned a title by many of the mother of the revolution. What is it like personifying uh, such a big political revolution? Very civil, I'm so happy to be with you. I'm so happy to speak with the students of Amsterdam University. Uh, that is a very important opportunity for me as a um, uh, top well, as an activist, as a woman who believe a lot on the role of the student on uh, making and creating uh, change and leading the uh, future. Uh, talking about revolution uh, in Yemen, it was it was a, um, a necessary step. It was a real need of Yemeni people uh, toward creating a new future, uh, a new future free, free from corruption, free from tyranny, free from injustice, and free from terrorism. So um, it was a real need for, uh, for, يعني, from, you know, for Yemeni people, especially for women and for youth who create that great you know, um, turning point um, of Yemen. Uh, I was lucky that um, I was one of the leader uh, uh, of Yemeni people in this great revolution. And also I was lucky that I started this uh, revolution and the call for the revolution even before the um, Arab Spring, before the uh, uh, January uh, 2011 when the uh, Ben Ali in Tunisia flee uh, Tunis um, uh, his cave, when he escaped uh, the call and the demands and the demonstra demonstrations of the people um, of Tunisia. So it was a long, uh, you know, period of uh, day, uh, weekly demonstrations and sit-ins in front of the uh, uh, cabinet in Yemen, uh, calling for uh, human rights, uh, um, uh, 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 common the attacking uh, human rights, the violations against Yemenis, the wars, the um, economic uh, corruption, and um, uh, and um, all the de deterioration that happened uh, um, in Yemen. So because of, because of that, I was honored that uh, Yemeni people called me the mother of revolution, and um, based on my previous rule um, of you know calling Yemenis to demonstrate and sit in. Uh, and make sit in and uh, protest peacefully uh, and demand for uh, freedom, equality, and democracy. And, and did you feel a sense of, of service or duty because of this big title that you were uh, awarded with? Of course, it is a big, big duty, even without this title. It's, you know, um, um, my duty as a woman who believed on herself and as a woman uh, and as a Yemeni citizen who believed um, on the future of Yemen people, who dreamed for uh, freedom, uh, equality, and democracy, and dare to, to export this dream to the people. So this is the, the responsibility came from that moment when I decide to dream and when I decide to make, to share my dream with people for, you know, noble values, for freedom, justice, and democracy. And also when Yemeni people believed on me and they, you know, they, they um, uh, in, in, the, in the beginning, yes, they ignored me. They didn't believe me. Um, they laughed at me. But when they started to believe on me and when they um, believed that, uh, they should be with me in the same path to freedom. 
that is, you know, the moment of carrying a big, big responsibility. Before 2011, as you said, you you were attempting and making efforts to export the dream for uh, freedom in Yemen, uh, particularly through your work in journalism. What was it like to be a female journalist and political activist in Yemen even before the protests began in 2011? So look, I always believe that freedom of, of expression is the main gate for democracy, and especially press freedom. So I used my right as a journalist on expressing my thoughts uh, through uh, writing my articles and doing my investigation, you know, um, uh, stories, uh, regardless of all the obstacles um, uh, that was around me. And also regardless what, 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 you know, how hard the topic that I will write about. So I use my right as a journalist and as a citizen before that, because I always say that every citizen has the right to express in himself about, with you know, voice, with audio, and also with TV. So it's very important that this, is, this, is, this right is belong to every citizen, is belong to every party, is belong to every organization. And, and at that moment, especially in 2004 and 2005, and before that, when I started my, 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 my journey on calling for press freedom and for expression rights, that was prevented, that was, you know, owning the media, especially the audio and the visual media, the TVs and radios is just monopolized by, you know, by the army, uh, uh, you know, and, and, the, uh, and the, the government. No one has the right to own this uh, media uh, outlets. And even with the written um, press, that was, you know, uh, um, you know, there was a lot of obstacles. There is a lot of, you know, laws that, uh, um, you know, uh, may, uh, held the journalists accountable when they criticize the president or the government or any kind of corruption. And so there was a lot of obstacles. There was, you know, a lot of crimes against journalists at, 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 at that time because they are, they, they were, and they still, all, all the authoritarian regime are afraid from the voice of people and are afraid from uh, press freedom and from uh, freedom of expression. So the journalism itself, it was my tool to express myself and to, to and to to, to, to 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 condemn the violence against people and also to tell the truth to um, speaking against corruption against dictator himself I started my journey as a journalist with you know criticizing the dictator the head of all problems uh, of Yemen um, and yeah journalism is the most important thing expression rights is the most important thing and still until now um, the voice of, uh, of people is something making you know, the dictators afraid and you know make them you know put a lot of obstacles against people and like like you you mentioned indeed uh, the situation for journalists was very very tough at that time and maybe still is but besides that you're you weren't just a journalist you were also a woman in in what ways do you feel that feminist and journalistic issues kind of intersect at that time that makes the challenge twice <laughs> as a journalist First, let's, let, let's talk about so it's still three challenges as a citizen. And this is, this, is, this is the most important thing, more than journalists, more than women. As a citizen, because in the authoritarian regimes, they don't want people to be real citizens. They prevent the equal citizenship. They, they just give the rights to their relatives, to their um, uh, tribes, to their parties. But the citizens, women and men, are prevented from even you know, the basic rights. So um, that was the big, the, the, the first challenge uh, to act as a citizen that has constitutional right to express on myself and to defend on human rights and to dream for my country to call for prosperity, to call for justice, to call for democracy and equality. And then, you know, 
as a, as, as a journalist who have, you know, a responsibility to tell the truth to the people, to don't make, you know, the, the, the face of the dictator, you know, uh, beautiful while it's uh, ugly, and uh, to don't play any decor as a journalist and also after that also as a woman. Then as a woman, woman has a lot of challenge as, you know, in, in a conservative, you know, uh, society that, uh, you know, suffer from um, bad uh, customs and traditions and also uh, suffer from bad uh, religious fatwas uh, and wrong religious fatwas and also uh, that suffer also from the uh, from the brutal and from the uh, laws and legislations that put a lot of obstacles uh, obstacles in front of women and those you know uh, those uh, its source came from the authoritarian re the authoritarian regime itself and from the dictator himself because he want uh, women to play um, just a traditional role to don't participate in the in public life and if she participates in public life mm -hmm. she should participate in a uh, very simple uh, 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 field that is just you know uh, play as a decor and you know and also with the, with, with women in, in environment so that was three you know obstacles that faced me as a woman as a journalist as a citizen but um, nothing stopped me nothing um, uh, prevent me from believing on myself and on Yemeni women and on Yemeni young people and on Yemeni people uh, in general that we will be uh, uh, one day together uh, for calling together for freedom uh, uh, and democracy. Because you, you also started the NGO Women Journalists Without Chains in 2005, if I'm correct. Um, what were, do you think, the main issues that you already kind of touched upon that, that made you set up this NGO amongst others? Look, uh, at that time when I um, uh, established Women Journalists Without Chains, that was the, you know, the biggest period uh, that uh, the government uh, and the, the dictator, the president, uh, was attacking you know, the uh, press freedom in general and um, uh, attacking the journalists, killing them, uh, arresting them, kidnapping them, blocking you know, the, the websites, uh, closing the newspapers, establishing um, uh, a, um, a, special, a, a special court for them. So uh, at that time, I asked myself, and this is what I always asking myself, what can I do? for my country, what can I do for people, you know, uh, around me, and uh, what can I do for expression rights, as I told you, you know, the expression rights is the most important gate for democracy. If we really guarantee the expression rights, that means that we will guarantee um, uh, a real democracy. So, uh, so that was the big, big question for me as a, as a journalist. Um, and we were waiting, uh, um, you know, um, an act from uh, journal, uh, journalists, Yemen journalist syndicate. But at that time, Yemen journalist syndicate didn't play a good role on supporting those journalists and those newspapers under the attack of the of the uh, government. So then, uh, Yani, um, we decide as 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 a journalist, woman journalists without borders. We were ten, you know, uh, women. Uh, we decided to make uh, women journalists without borders to um, to, create, you know, to 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 protect uh, expression rights and uh, in general and press freedom in particular. And I was the president at the yani on this uh, of this um, organization, but the uh, government was so 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 angry. How uh, an organization, a journalism, a journalist, uh, a press, you know, uh, uh, organization, and also women organization, and also led by Tawakul, that is a big catastrophe <laughs> for them. So then they uh, closed it and they took the license. Um, then I, uh, I decided to establish another organization. So, and um, I call it Women Journalists Without Chains. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it was bitter than borders. And 
I told them that, okay, I will not take um, a permission from you uh, before we took the license, and now I will not take the license. Uh, if you want to give the license, you should give it to my office. This is our constitutional right. Um, I'm acting as, as a citizen and I am protecting myself by, by, by the constitutional right. Uh, right. So, um, yeah, so I just telling you that uh, I established this woman journalist without chance. And if you want to close it, close it and take me to the prison. And it was a big, big fight for that. And Women Journalists Without Chess did a great work, did a great work from the day one, from the day one when we refused to take the license from the from the uh, government because we know that they will say give it to another organization. We tell them bring it to us. This is our constitutional right. right. And also uh, by gathering, you know, a lot of uh, NGOs together in a coalition calling for uh, human rights and also by leading the streets, um, as I told you, every uh, Tuesday in front of the cabinet, uh, every Tuesday, we didn't stop this uh, uh, sit-in and demonstration until the revolution erupted. So Women Journalists Without Chains was behind uh, uh, organizing all the events in front of the uh, cabinet in, uh, in a square we called it Freedom Square. Um, uh, and um, the first demand was uh, expression rights. The second demand was many demands. You know, it depends about the people who came to the square. For example, if they are teachers, if they are teachers, or if they are doctors, or if they are uh, villagers, people from village, or, or any victim who needs anything, the Freedom Square was open to them. And Women Journalists Without Chains was, you know, the organization who who, who organized all that protests. All these difficulties uh, and constraints for, for women and relating to women participation uh, translate to a 0.7% uh, female participation in parliament in 2013, um, in, in the political reality of Yemen, and only one female delegate at the table of the 2018 peace talks in Stockholm. You, however, were part of parliamentary politics in Yemen, and uh, we'd like to ask you, uh, did you face difficulties with regards to your gender and your active participation in politics? Look, the situation of women in uh, most of the you know, countries around the world is in you know, suffering is really, there is no real uh, equal participation of women in public life. But the percentage is, you know, difference between country to country, and it becomes worse in the Middle East, and it becomes worse, more worse, you know, in, in countries like uh, uh, Yemen. But I believe that this is, you know, special in Yemen and other countries like Yemen. It, it became because the lack of um, uh, the lack of, uh, of will from the uh, governments. Uh, yes, there is a uh, uh, yani, um, percentage of you know the uh, traditions and customs and some social you know causes etc. But the most important thing, the most important cause is because of the the legislations that put you know um, obstacles in front of women to participate in the public life or to access to the basic rights. Uh, because of the, the poverty, because of the uh, corruption, and because of, also, uh, because of the will of the authority to marginalize women. So, if we, if you talk about the rule of women under the under the rule of the dictator, of course, women suffered a lot, and there was not any real will to give women their rights, especially the political rights. Uh, but after, uh, and there was a lot of demands, a lot of demands, especially from women movement, calling for the political rights of women. Uh, but, but I always said that if we want to reach to the political rights for women and men, we should first force this dictator to leave the authority. 
because at that time, we will be able to make reforms in the legislations, either they are laws or the constitution. We will make the, right, the woman's rights as right, not as a gift from any authority or from anyone. And that is exactly what happened with the, uh, uh, you know, Arab Spring uh, countries. All Arab Spring countries, after the fall of the dictator, they wrote in their constitutions and laws real rights that give, you know, women their rights. For example, in Yemen, we gave her in our draft of constitution 30% at, uh, at least as her, you know, um, rights, you know, uh, uh, in every institution in the country. And also we prevent, for example, uh, the, um, the early marriage, which is, which this early marriage is, is a cause that it takes a long time of struggle from women and people who support women in this great, you know, uh, demand to stop early marriage. So, et cetera, et cetera. So what we called and what we asked from the dictator before the revolution, we wrote it in the draft of, uh, of constitution after you know the winning you know of the first step of the uh, of the revolution when we forced the dictator to leave and when we started to write the constitution the same thing with most of the arab countries if we remember um uh, for example tunis where i mean they wrote you know for uh, 50 percent for women 50 percent for women for women in, in their constitution so i believe that Woman shouldn't ask her rights. She should take it. And she will not be able to take it if there is authoritarian regime prevent her as a woman and prevent her as a citizen to practice her you know, uh, democratic uh, rights. Like you mentioned. The same thing if you talk about education, the same thing if you talk about health, the, all this, you know, it's is a result of corruption, is a result of injustice, is a result of mar marginal, uh, uh, marginalizing the most important, you know, yeah, I mean, half of the half half of the half the half of the society, at least it's half women half of the society, it's it's a policy from the authoritarian regimes because they are afraid from the rule of this half. On you know, uh, yani, uh, participating uh, in the life, especially if this hat is a woman. And while yani, uh, all you know the studies proved that when women lead, she lead in a very good way. When women lead, when women decide something, she uh, achieve it. And because of that, the dictator you know, was afraid from the, the revolution, was led you know, by women, because without women, he wouldn't you know, uh, leave the, uh, the authority until now. Women forced you know, the, 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 the dictator to leave the, uh, the authority in Yemen and uh, Egypt and uh, Tunis, of course, with the men. But uh, if, if it's without women, nothing will happen. You mentioned not only Yemen, but uh a lot of the Arab region countries that were going through a similar process during the Arab Spring in 2011. Uh, do you find the commonalities and do you think that the struggle of the Yemeni people is a struggle ultimately of the entire region? Could you repeat that question? Uh, I didn't understand it. Sorry yeah. about that. Now, you mentioned not only Yemen, but uh, for example Tunisia and Egypt uh, as, uh, as countries that were going through similar issues uh, with Yemen. So I wanted to ask you, uh, do you see that the, the, the struggle the, the, the society of Yemen was going through is perhaps a struggle that a lot of regions, a lot of places in the region were going through? And are there any commonalities worth exploring? Really, I, I, I couldn't catch your, your last uh, you know, uh, words of the question, but in general, maybe I, I understand. Look. What happened in Arab Spring in, Kent, uh, in general and in Yemen in particular and in Egypt? Now Egypt is suffering from the military coup. We did a great revolution against dictators, against dictators in the region. So we did a great war, you know, saving 
the world from those dictators that collapsed the global peace, that they are the resource of chaos, wars, and even terrorism. And we can explain how those dictators align with terrorism and how they used terrorism as a tool to blackmail the West and at the same time to attack their opponents in their, in their uh, countries. So we think that we did a great thing for our countries and also for the world when we decided to uh, make our revolutions against this tyrannies, against dictatorism, against corruption, and against terrorism. Uh, and we did a great work when we forced them in, in Tunis, in Yemen, in Egypt, and even in Libya. And later, in the second wave of, uh, of Arab uh, Spring in 2019, in Sudan and Algeria, when we forced those dictators to leave the authority. Uh, but what happened after that? That the counter-revolution came. The counter-revolutions led by Saudi and Emirates. Saudi and Iran, those three countries doesn't want Yemen, Egypt, Tunis, uh, Libya, Syria, uh, Sudan, Algeria, and even Iraq and Lebanon when they started the, 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 the revolution. They don't want these countries to be a democratic country. They are afraid from democracy because they are afraid if their people will revolt against them. And in Yemen, with Yemen, there is another thing that they are afraid from Yemen, especially Saudi and UAE. They are afraid from Yemen as a, as a country. If this country becomes a democratic country, if this country becomes a strong country, that, you know, as they think, that will threaten them. So they don't want Yemen to be a strong country. They are afraid from Yemeni people. They are jealous from Yemeni walls, uh, uh, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are suffering. All of us suffering from the counter revolution that attack the revolutionary people and that 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 that, that produce all that chaos, wars, terrorism, civil wars, military coup. All of that is, you know, faces of the counter revolution. So if you don't mind me interrupting, do you do, are you saying that the reason that Yemen didn't end up becoming a democracy was because of Iranian and Saudi Arabian influences? Exactly. Exactly. This is a, yes, this is it it is because of the counter revolution led by Saudi Emirates and Iran. They are they supported Iran supported the militia, Houthi militia, Saudi and Emirate uh, waged war in Yemen. All of them, they want to collapse Yemen because they don't want Yemen to be a democratic country. And because they are afraid from Arab Spring itself, from the value of democracy itself. So yes, we are paying the price of refusing the authoritarian regimes, of uh, protesting against them, and we are now paying the price of, you know, of um, continuing our struggle for democracy and uh, continuing our sacrifice for democracy. So this is the result of the counter revolution, and it is not the result of revolution itself. So we win our battle when we free our, you know, uh, the, the the region from those dictators. It's, it's seven dictators. In 10 years, we, we freed the region from seven dictators. And it is, you know, seven, seven dictators that they ruled the, 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 the region for decades. This is a big achievement. It is the first step, and it needs a lot of steps after that to reach the democracy. And you know, in, uh, in, uh, in Netherlands, how it take time to, 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 to reach to democracy? Why? Western governments, why some people want other people to take, to make the revolution and to gain democracy at the same time. That is impossible. That is especially if there is conspiracy from the Western governments. Some of the Western governments who accepted the rule of the leader of the counter-revolution. 
when there is some of the conspiracy that, you know, di- directly or indirectly, when they accepted, for example, the military coup in Egypt with the Sisi, or with the uh, militia coup uh, in, in, uh, in Libya with Hatta. So or, the war in, or the war in Yemen uh, led by Saudi and Emirates uh, or militia, uh, Houthi militia uh, back from Iran, etc., etc. So it's not just uh, the Iranian government then, or the Saudi Arabian government, but it's also the Western governments that are quiet during their times of insurgency. Yeah, exactly. They are, either they are quiet, which is uh, the, yeah, to be silenced in front of all these war crimes, and all this attack against emergence in a democracy and against the will of people that is kind of participating in the conspiracy. Or another thing, which is direct conspiracy, because there is some of the government, Western government was really allied, you know, with Saudi Emirates, you know, uh, on uh, on uh, and uh, and uh, military in Egypt on organizing the uh, coup uh, in Egypt against the purest elected president in the history of the um, of Egypt. Yet when we when we look at Yemen today, uh, we still see uh, a lot of hardship. Is uh, Yemen now at least off to a better future than it was before? Before the Re- look, Arab Spring Revolution? Yeah. yeah. Look, um, when we talk about the current situation, we suffered from from this chaos, from this uh, coups, from these wars, all that. That doesn't mean that we lose the future. No, we are paying this huge, this you know, blood, all this you know, you know, huge cost for the future. We believe that the future will be great. And the future will be really with freedom and democracy. And all this cost, all this uh, blood, all this prisons, all this you know violence, all this you know suffer will you know will not go for nothing. That will lead to real democracy. And we are optimistic in the future because we know that that we are. We are facing our destiny when we fight, when we face those counter revolutions because our revolutions is great. So if it's something, it is, it is it, if it's symbol, if it's not, you know, they will not be afraid and they will let it go. No, they are facing a real, uh, a real threat to their rule. And yes, yes, they should be afraid. They should be afraid, and um, yeah, they are authoritarian regime. They, they, yeah, they should be afraid because people will revolt against them today, after uh, tomorrow, after one year, ten years, people will revolt against them. So you can't blame them because they are afraid from our movement, from our Arab Spring, from our revolution. But the one who you can blame them is the Western government, who supported them. Who said that they are democrat and they support democracy, and while they betrayed democracy, while they betrayed their values on supporting women's rights and human right, human rights and equality and justice, when they made a alli- alliance with, the, with those dictators, so um, yes, the, those dictators are defending themselves, and they, we will not g- give up, and we will continue our revolutions. And as long as there is injustice, as long as there is corruption from the Gulf to the ocean, we will continue our revolution. I will, it's, it takes you know, waves and waves and waves. You see the second wave of Arab Spring in 2019, and you will see the, thir- the third la- wave and the fourth uh, wave until you will not find any dictator in the, uh, in the region. But it's very important that the Western government to decide with us how much the cost will be. What would you say is needed for this to reach this uh, democratic future that uh, you'd so like to see in Yemen? Again, sorry? Sorry. Uh, what, what would be needed to, for, for a better future for Yemen to reach a democratic Yeah. Yeah. Look, now Yemen is suffering from wars. 
and Yemen is now يعني, suffering from the worst humanitarian, يعني, humanitarian crisis um, uh, يعني, in recent history, uh, as the United Nations said. So this war in Yemen should stop. And um, yeah, uh, we should enter to the political process, political process that led to um, free Yemen from any kind of guardianship uh, of Saudi and Emirates. Saudi and Emirates should leave Yemen because they are occupying Yemen now. They wage the war under the pretext that they are uh, supporting the legitimacy of uh, President Hadi against the Houthi militia coup. While the reality is that they are attacking his legitimacy and they are weakening the legitimacy you know, um, authority and they are uh, um, supporting new militias against Yemen, against Yemenis, against the uh, President Hadi, against the, the government, and also they occupied la lands and ports and uh, airports. And at the same time, Houthi militia played a bad role in Yemen, and you know, with their coup, this coup should stop. And Yemeni people should return to the pro political process and should put you know, the draft of constitution to be in the referendum and to start a new uh, election. So this is this is one. Yeah, it's it's a long, it's a it's a, a detailed uh, recipe for the uh, sustainable, peaceful uh, uh, transition, the sustainable, peaceful, uh, um, you know, and political uh, process. Uh, we call for it, but at the same time, there is Yemeni people in the land and outside, inside Yemen and outside Yemen, who refuse all these outsiders' agendas, Saudi, Emirates, and Iran, and they are the one who will decide the future. But with the with the with the mechanisms, we have that you know mechanism, and, and I give you some of the points, important points of it. This uh, this transition of Yemen, uh, this reform rather. What do you think it should uh, look like? Should it be progressive or conservative, uh, secular or uh, religious? Democratic. Democratic, you know, uh, um, uh, regime that allows all the ideas to be represented, to allow all people to, uh, to engage and to organize themselves in groups, in parties, in syndicates, that doesn't prevent anyone from peaceful, uh, you know, uh, talk, uh, from uh, expression rights, that doesn't, you know, push any groups to uh, to act, you know, um, uh, by, I mean, with violence. So a democratic country that allows all Yemeni's people uh, to be there, to participate in political life, and also all Yemeni uh, sides uh, to, to participate in the uh, wealth and power. And what about Yemen as a state? Do you see the future for Yemen in one whole Yemen, or do you see it in a separate northern and southern state? Uh, I believe that a united Yemen is a very important choice for, uh, for, for Yemen and also for saving you know, the um, uh, global peace. But what kind of united Yemen? It is not like united Yemen before, uh, under the rule of uh, dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh. No, to be a federal country, a federal country that you know um, we can we can agree on how many you know states inside you know this you know federalism uh, system. Uh, but federalism is a very important solution for um, uh, most of the Yemeni uh, problems. Apart from your activism, and uh, in, uh, you've been a member of the Al Isla Party, uh, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, up until 2018, uh, with a presentation in the House of Representatives of Yemen. What brought you to become politically aligned with this party, or affiliated perhaps? Um, unfortunately, now there is a big difference between me and between the Isla Party. 
um, because you know, but uh, it's my party now. Um, they didn't make any act against the occupation um, of Saudi and Emirates uh, in Yemen. And when I uh, condemn, you know, the Saudi Arabia and Emirates, they freeze, you know, my membership. So um, there's a big, big differences between, you know, our views, uh, you know, about Yemen, not just, not just in the in the current, you know, uh, situation after the war uh, in Yemen, and even, you know, in the revolution, uh, why uh, in the peaceful revolution um, uh, time, uh, there was um, and still a big differences uh, between us. But also, in general, I respect, I respect, you know, um, uh, Islah party uh, people, youth, especially their youth, even you know, they have a very good, you know, um, ideas and they are so active and they are so honest and et cetera, et cetera. And the same thing with other, you know, parties like uh, Al Nasri, which is the national, the um, yeah, the national, you know, uh, uh, party or the social party, which is I am so close to them, so close to them. Even in before, you know, before the revolution, even from the my beginning of the of the, uh, um, يعني, I, I, in the public life as a journalist, I was right. يعني, يعني, I wrote mo- all my articles in the uh, um, newspaper of Al Thawri, uh, newspaper which is the uh, newspaper of the social uh, party. So I am close to all the parties, and I I think that I am one of all this. You know, um, yeah, many parties are so close to each other. But unfortunately, now, now there is a big problem with the Islah Party, with Social Party, with National Party. All those parties didn't make a great position against the occupation of Yemen from Saudi and Emirates. And there is a big gap between Yemeni people, between Yemeni youth, and even their members, even their members and those and you know leaders, especially the leaders in Saudi. Most of the leaders of those political parties are in the uh, in Saudi, are in some kind of house arrest. Like our president, he is in Riyadh in some kind of house arrest. He, they couldn't return to Yemen. So there is a big differences between them and between people. You know, even they are their members and other you know Yemeni people. During this conversation, it's apparent you're advocating and fighting for a democratic and united Yemen. Uh, you have been affiliated with an Islamist political party with ties to the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, from a Western perspective, these all might seem a bit conflicting. Could you please help us understand the intricacies of politics in Yemen that make all these things align together? Yeah, many people, yeah, many people are so simple. And there is no, as I told you, there is no that big differences between ideologies. Yeah, many people, um, you know, they are Muslims. Uh, they are j- just, you know, the differences with, with their, you know, programs um, toward, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, the election and all those parties, all those parties, unfortunately, before the revolution, was play as it as I said in my articles, they play a decor, you know, they, they play a decor to make the face of the dictator um, uh, beautiful. So that that there is not that battle between uh, Muslims brotherhoods and the nationalists, nationalists and the socialists and other parties that is not there is not that you know big difference now the difference real difference is between those people who call for freedom and those leaders of parties who accept to be the hand of the Iran, or Saudi and Emirates. This is, you know, the real differences now in this period between Yemenis. Besides uh, the Yemeni struggle, we see we see a Palestinian flag behind you. What is what is your position on on that struggle that's currently also going on in the world? I support Palestinian issue. 
I support them um, in the face of the uh, Israeli occupation. Um, I support, you know, the existence of two uh, uh, states based on the um, international, you know, agreements. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I think that um, uh, Israeli governments, governments in general, they are um, playing, you know, uh, a very um, uh, bad role. And they made a very big mistake when they think that with their alliance with the with the dictators they will save Israel. No, they should know that they have to be with people in the region that we can live in. You know, in a one country, uh, we can live as a neighbors. We can respect each other as Muslims, as Jewish, as uh, Christian. As we can, you know, it's it's this land is you know. Is, is enough for all you know people belong to this land. But if they think that they with their alliance with Muhammad bin Salman or with Muhammad bin Zayed that they will win, uh, they are you know يعني, wrong. And like we talked about before, the influence of Western governments in, in these types of conflicts and struggles is also very apparent, I think, uh, in the case of Israel and the ties it has to the US. How do you think that um these Western governments play a role in the general struggle of the Middle East? Unfortunately, they didn't, they didn't commit to their values. They didn't play a good role on achieving what they promised their peoples and also people around the world when they announced themselves as a free countries as a democratic country that respect human rights. Unfortunately, they make, uh, and most of them, I don't want to say all of them, most of them, they play bad role when they ally with the dictators and with counter revolutions. And when they think that their interests will be guaranteed by those dictators, they commit a big mistake. The real thing and the most important thing that they have to know, to know that people own the future not the dictators and if they if they think with the long you know strategy i think they will uh, rebuild their strategies on supporting the people you know who call for freedom and and democracy and now let's talk about now uh, with the new administration uh, in uh, in america with biden administration who promised the world and who promised american people that they will uh his administration will um you know make an alliance and will support the freedom around the world and especially in in middle east and they will not you know stand with dictators and uh, and for example they will do all their effort to stop wars um, around you know in in the, in, in the region and special in yemen but unfortunately until now uh we didn't see real steps uh, to achieve, you know, um, uh, these promises. But do you think that Western interference is the solution? Don't you think that maybe Western nations should kind of be sidelined in these in these conflicts? Look, we don't say, call them to interfere. We call them to, to don't make obstacles in front of us while we are struggling and while we are working for freedom and democracy. So we don't uh, interfere and no, stop them. No, no, we tell them so to don't support them, to don't give them the legitimacy. When we revolt against those dictators, you should do your responsibilities. The responsibility that you should do first, you should freeze their assets. Second, when they those dictators commit crimes against humanity, when they attack their people, when they use violence, those people should be trialed in the uh, International Criminal Court, the ICC. And when coup happened, military coup happened, or anything like that, you shouldn't give them the legitimacy. For example, when Sisi make his military coup, the Western government should refuse that. But what happened, it was, you know, they, they recognize it. 
So etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's, yeah, it doesn't mean that when we tell the yeah, them no come interfere, come with your uh, muscles or with your tongues or you know, come you know to us you know uh, uh, you know and uh, help us. No, don't support the dictators. That is enough for us. That is enough for us. And do your work in the international you know body with the UN. Regarding the and and other you know international you know organization organizations like uh, international criminal court or other you know bodies. Well, <clears throat> Mrs. Corbin, uh, you're a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, uh, a new mother, a Facebook advisory board member, and founder of multiple organizations and NGOs that advocate for human rights. You seem to already have done your part in making this world a better place, not only for the Middle East and Yemen, but also for all of us. What will we be seeing from you in the future? Regarding the... What will we be seeing from you in the future regarding your activism? Yeah. Are you as, as a youth? As, no, from you, from, from you, you as, as a person. You've already done so much. Again, please could you repeat the, the question? The, the voice, I, I, I lose it. Sorry for that. No, it's, it's, it's completely fine. Uh, I said that you've already done quite, quite a lot to make the world a better place for all of us and fought for a lot of issues that we're fighting for. However, uh, what will we be seeing from you in the future? Look, what I, what I encourage people around the world and, um, you know, people like you, they have to be courage enough to push their governments, to don't make alliance with the government, uh, with the dictators around the world, and to support those you know people who call for freedom and democracy. For me, as Tawakul, I will continue my rule, you know, uh, and my duty and my responsibility, and my promises to the people to be part of this great struggle to free my country and to free the region from those dictators. So people like you and people like me should be committed to these values and don't give up. Well, thank you, Ms. Carmen. It was lovely speaking to you. It was very informative thank you. Thank as well. Um, as for our audience, this was the last interview of this academic year. However, you can find us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or whatever application you listen to podcasts on. So make sure to check it out and leave a review. And next year we'll be kicking off with feminist economics, uh, economist Marilyn Warren. See you then. Thank you, Ms. Carmen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>